The year was 1975. It was a warm June evening in South Carolina, and 14-year-old Jason White was ready to prove his mettle. Like a lot of boys his age, it mattered a great deal to him that his peers saw him as strong, tough, and most importantly of all, brave. That's why he was camped out, alone, just outside of the junkyard as the sky went dark above him. He had heard rumors about the things that went on inside the junkyard. Scary things. Unnatural things. But Jason wasn't about to let those stories scare him. He knew for a fact that the junkyard had been abandoned for months, if not longer. Nobody was in there. He'd be fine. Or at least, that's what he kept telling himself. With the moon high up in the sky, Jason crept into the junkyard, using a flashlight's beam to light his way. Behind the towers of busted-down cars and scrap metal, he heard a distant but loud grinding noise. Was it coming from one of the warehouses? No, that's impossible, he thought, just his mind playing tricks on him. But curiosity compelled him to get closer. Jason approached the warehouse and saw that the big iron door was still ajar. His heart was in his throat as he peered into the building and saw the impossible. It was a man. No, a machine. Cobbled together from pipes, wires, and aluminum. It was using a power saw to cut apart metal on a workbench. But it wasn't just one robot. There was movement all around it, jerking and twitching in the shadows. As his flashlight beam passed over them, Jason saw the moving, living bodies of a menagerie of metal creatures. He screamed in shock and the robotic denizens of the warehouse all turned and looked at him. Jason had never felt more afraid in his life, until the humanoid robots still carrying the power saw turned and began walking towards him. It was waving his free hand around wildly in what Jason perceived as some kind of threat. Letting out another animal screech, Jason turned and ran all the way out of the junkyard, until the sounds of clanking metal faded out behind him. Jason was scarred for life. And in that moment, he vowed never to return to his local junkyard ever again. And this was a wise choice, because not long after that, a very different group would be commandeering the junkyard. And as fans of this channel will know, they don't take kindly to intruders. If you've ever been on a long road trip through a rural part of the United States, you've most likely seen a few quirky signs and wacky looking businesses along the way. Whether it's a diner with a dinosaur protruding out of the front, a gas station shaped like a UFO, or a particularly weird mural, businesses in the small towns lining the freeways often have to get creative when it comes to attracting patrons. Locations like this saw their heyday in the 1950s and 1960s. But as the cost of gasoline skyrocketed in the 70s, and technological advances in aviation made flights more accessible as a form of travel, less and less people were making long cross-country drives on a regular basis. This caused an economic downturn in many small towns, and led to a large number of quirky and unique roadside locations being abandoned by their owners. Some have been torn down or remodeled, but others remain as they were hanging on as tourist destinations and serving as reminders of a bygone era. One such place that you might encounter if you ever find yourself heading down I-95 South is Jamaica Joe's Junkyard Jubilee. The colorful storefront is decorated with a mural depicting a picturesque tropical lagoon, while a sign reads One Love in hand-painted green and yellow letters. At first glance, this might just seem like another roadside oddity, but if you were to try and check it out, you'd be blocked by a patrol of six armed guards, SCP Foundation agents of course, and depending on how much you saw, you might be administered an amnestic before being sent on your way. Because Jamaica Joe's isn't just another junkyard, it's SCP-100. SCP-100 came to the Foundation's attention on November 9, 1976, after tracking a series of rumors about a mysterious abandoned scrapyard where the machines ran on their own, and strange metal figures could be seen patrolling the grounds. When the Foundation arrived at the site, they installed wooden privacy screens around the fence of the junkyard, replaced the storefront windows with one-way glass, and redirected the highway through a nearby town to keep civilian traffic from getting too close. 
Jamaican Joe's Junkyard Jubilee is 5,000 square meters of fenced-off land located in rural South Carolina. As the name suggests, it's a junkyard made up of two warehouses, a storefront, a small residential building, and a storage space containing roughly 1,500 vehicles of varying makes and models, some of which have been compressed into cubes. There is also a variety of other metal scrap on the site altogether valued to be worth about $5,000, pocket change to an organization like the SCP Foundation. Just like many other cases where the anomaly cannot be relocated to a pre-established Foundation containment site uh -huh. for research, the SCP Foundation instead brought the research to the anomaly. The larger of the two warehouses on site is now the de facto research center for all matters involving SCP-100, as well as a temporary residence for on-site staff. It is important to note that there is nothing anomalous about the location itself, but within the area of the junkyard are a variety of Euclid-class anomalous entities. The property was, at one point, owned by a man by the name of Joseph Duval, presumably the titular Jamaican Joe. However, the whereabouts of Mr. Duval are unknown. Research into local records show that the utility bills to Mr. Duval's personal address had stopped around three months before the junkyard was found. Upon the first sweep of the location, the Foundation found no evidence of human habitation, save for one note taped to the door of the storefront, reading, Out to lunch, please see assistant, JJ. The first anomaly that was cataloged on the site was SCP-100-1, a humanoid automaton made of scrap metal mainly copper wires and tin cans. SCP-100-1 has a limited degree of sapience, and although it has no means of verbal or written communication, it does speak through the use of rudimentary sign language. It seems uninterested in conversation, though, unless the topic has to do with the sale of scrap metal. The information the Foundation has been able to learn from SCP-100-1 has been limited, but the fact it appears to be mostly work and very little play is incredibly clear. What it lacks in conversational skills, it makes up for in craftsmanship. SCP-100-1 has been shown to be very adept at using an arc welder, drill, power saw, and other machinery found around the junkyard. Through its metalworking skills, it is able to create more beings like itself from the scrap that surrounds it. When given the chance, SCP-100-1 usually creates automatons that resemble one of four animal species – flamingo, crocodile, turtle, or iguana. However, it's also able to create metal copies of other creatures, from bugs to domestic pet breeds like cats and dogs. While the Foundation usually destroys the new constructs created by SCP-100-1, it has been allowed to keep two in order to keep it placid and preserve a cordial working relationship with the Foundation operatives on site. These two metal creatures, which both resemble large metal insects, have been designated SCP-100-2-A, and SCP-100-2-B, though it seems SCP-100-1 has named them Raymone and Beatrice, respectively, based on the fact that those names are welded into the backs of the creatures. Raymone and Beatrice fulfill the role of perimeter guards as well as companions to SCP-100-1. SCP-100-1 and its pets are peaceful in nature, and in fact if they ever breach the perimeter of the junkyard, they lose all autonomy, seeming to shut down until they are brought back within the perimeter. As such, containment breaches are nearly all to come from outsiders trying to infiltrate the building rather than any of the anomalies escaping. SCP-100-1's main function seems to be running the junkyard in the absence of the mysterious Jamaican Joe Duval. It spends most of its days sorting scrap metal, building new constructs, and performing maintenance tasks around the yard, and the robot seems to follow a very strict, ritualistic schedule. From 8 a.m. to 3 p.m., SCP-100-1 enters the storefront area of the junkyard. When a customer enters the shop, SCP-100-1 will take its position behind the front desk and begin bargaining with them, using hand gestures to convey meaning. SCP-100-1 possesses the ability to perform the basic mental arithmetic required to keep track of sales, despite seemingly being unable to read. When SCP-100-1 has been observed making sales to customers, the Foundation has found that the robot can be very underhanded and unfair when it comes to running its business, like a kind of metallic Mr. Krabs. Frequently, it has been seen intentionally selecting low-quality scrap or using scales that it knows are faulty in order to scam customers. It also sells the animal automatons that it creates, knowing full well that they will stop working as soon as they're taken out of the junkyard. 
In cases where customers have rightfully come back to demand refunds, SCP-100-1 invariably responds by gesturing to a sign on the wall which reads, No refunds, Mom, written in a phonetic Jamaican accent. After clocking out for the day, at 3 p.m., SCP-100-1 spends an hour maintaining and socializing with Raymond A. and Beatrice, its two insect-like pets. It will also communicate with them through hand gestures, and will engage them in games of fetch or hide-and-seek in the junkyard. From 4 p.m. until 8 p.m., SCP-100-1 spends its time taking stock and cleaning all the tools and machinery on the premises. It also takes time to clean both the interiors and exteriors of the various buildings on the site. Then at 8 p.m. it appears to wind down for the day with some leisure activities, including making more constructs, playing some more with its pets, and taking strolls around the perimeter of the site. This leisure time lasts until midnight, when SCP-100-1 will retire to the residential part of the junkyard. The robot doesn't need to sleep, but it does seem to rest, sitting motionless at a desk from midnight until 8 a.m., when it resumes the schedule again from the beginning. This was all that was observed at SCP-100 for decades following its discovery. SCP-100-1 was seemingly content with its life and with the tasks that came with running the junkyard. However, on June 3, 2005, SCP-100-1 did something it had never done before. As mentioned, SCP-100-1 had only been seen using its skills to create autonomous animals from scrap metal, but on June 3rd, it chose to create something else. Another humanoid. The automaton was only 10 centimeters tall, but SCP-100-1 took great care in crafting it, much more so than any of its creations. It gave the small figure distinct facial features and made the whole thing from high-quality stainless steel. When SCP-100-1 was finished with its creation, it welded the letters JJ onto the back and took it into the storefront. During its 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. shift that day, SCP-100-1 sat at the desk with JJ on the desk next to itself, and the two seemed to carry on a conversation through signing and gestures. As was policy with all of SCP-100-1's constructs, excluding Raymond A. and Beatrice, JJ was confiscated, which SCP-100-1 took very badly. Following JJ's removal, SCP-100-1 returned to the residential building and stayed there remaining inert for a total of 10 days. It is unsure what really happened to the original Jamaican Joe, or what his precise relationship was with SCP-100-1. Given the difficulty in communicating with SCP-100-1, it is possible that we'll never know for sure. But from what little we're able to glean from the enigmatic Out to Lunch, please see assistant JJ note he left behind, it's very possible that before he left, Jamaican Joe may have created the best assistant a junkyard owner could possibly ask for. Now go check out SCP-5049 The Skin Salesman, Demon Dan's Discount Homunculus Depot, and SCP-3008 Trapped in Ikea for more supernatural enterprises from SCP Explained.